kind of break it up. Um, I know a number of people in, in the room, you know me as a, as a Californian, but it's actually a great pleasure for me to be back in Colorado. I actually met my better half, I met my wife in, Col in Colorado 50 years ago now, so at least I know enough to be dangerous. Um, now, I, I wanna start by just making sure I'm in the right room. I haven't had much sleep lately, been on the road a lot. Uh, can I just see show of hands, how many people in the room are aging? Can I just, good, I'm, I, must, I must be in the, in the right place. So, uh, so what I'm gonna do, try to do in about 45 minutes, which is gonna be an interesting challenge, is I'm gonna give you a year-long course. Uh, so what I want you to do is focus on my slides and I'm gonna go really fast. So we're gonna cover uh, a, lot of, a lot of material. Let me start out by saying that, that aging is a, really in many ways, a tale of two cities, a tale of two outcomes. Uh, uh, it's really important to talk about older adults as a human capital asset, as our only growing natural resource, as, a, as an opportunity for great potential growth, et cetera, but it's also important that we not trivialize or diminish the challenges of aging, which is, of course, one of the challenges that all of us in the field face. How do we communicate both the potential and the realities of the challenges I'm gonna try to do that for you today. I'm gonna to start off with, with those challenges, but let's start off with some demography. So, about a billion people, 60 plus in the, in the world today, that number is gonna double by, by 2050, and by the way, conservative estimate, and I'll explain why in a, in a minute. Just to, just to give you a more graphic version of this, here's the population, 65 plus today. You can see kind of the darker, re, darker regions are the, are the uh, uh, places with the, with the most constant, concentrated older populations. But look what happens in 2060. Uh, so, so the reality is, is the world is going to look much older in decades to come. For all of the young people in this group, and that's why this topic is not just a topic for the silent generation, for my generation, the boomers, for Xers. It is very much a topic for millennials and, and, and Gen Z we are all looking at a much older world, and even in places like India and Sub-Saharan Africa, where the, where the populations are younger, at least for a period of time, they'll experience aging in a much more rapid way than, for example, has been the case in Europe. So they need to adapt, adapt as well. Here's the US population, 65 plus in millions, a pretty impressive chart. And, uh, and we heard already, I think, some of the Colorado dem demographics, but just, I I'd say particularly, look, look at that 80 plus number. And again, conservative estimates for reasons I'll, I'll discuss. Uh, as you probably know, this is a, a point of, of pride for, co for Colorado. You have the, the county with the longest lived population in the United States, it's Summit County. Uh, that is not me, by the way, with the, with the skis. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but he looks like he's doing fine. So just again, con context. When Social Security was introduced in 1935, the average lifespan was 61.7 years. Isn't that remarkable? Um, so I, I said earlier that, that these numbers are, are conservative, and this is what I want you to think about. In the wake of the decoding of the human genome, which is really a fairly recent phenomenon, we have Scientific institutions, this is just a handful, just some names to make the point, all over the world focused on two things, on certainly on extension of healthy lifespan, of healthy longevity, but also on extension of lifespan. Uh, just, you know, to name one name, Calico, which is uh, one, of, one of the companies of Alphabet, as you, as you probably know, run by Art Levinson, who, uh, who's a, a prominent, not only uh, scientist, but, but business leader, but really happening all over the world. So those numbers that we saw earlier, the, the numbers uh, globally, US, Colorado, et cetera, in many, in many ways relate to a series of very conservative estimates about, uh, about extended longevity. Now we had a comment earlier about 150, and I have to tell you, honestly, there's no evidence to support that. There just, is, there just isn't. So uh, a lot of people talk about the, the implications, for example, of 100-year lives, certainly a more possible uh, outcome, but even if lifespans ex extend on average by three, four, five years, the consequences are dramatic, as you'll see in a minute. 
So when I think about aging, I think about three big buckets. Just kind of my own framing, health, financial security, and purpose, and I'm gonna talk about all three quickly. Health challenges, and again, I said this is a tale of, a tale of two outcomes. So today we spend about 3.5 trillion annually on, on health, 90% of it on chronic disease, NCDs, non-communicable diseases. This is maybe kind of an ironic bullet point as we all talk about coronavirus, uh, in our in our daily uh, daily conversations uh, these days, but you can you can see the the reality of that data. The third dot I want to call your attention to: AD, Alzheimer's, and and other dementias, around 270 billion dollars in direct care cost in the United States. But here's what's important about about this, and I think this is particularly important important in a in a conference about work and workforce. So that, those numbers, the 195 billion, the 63 billion, and even the 1.3 trillion in 2050, discount the inclusion of productivity numbers, which I think uh, when I talk, Brian, to, to health economists, I always say you have to not just talk about disease care cost, you have to talk about the loss of productivity of disease sufferers and caregivers. Our calculus is today, that if you add that number into the, num into the number of care costs, even today that number approaches a trillion bucks, which is extraordinary if you think about the potential to invest that in public health, in education, in infrastructure. Again, I live in Los Angeles with an, with an airport that uh, is laughably, ba laughably bad, bad the these days, uh, either curing or frankly just impeding, slowing the onset of Alzheimer's and other dementias great potential for savings. We know these numbers. I, I, I'd ask the question, how many smokers are there in the room? My guess is none or maybe one or two, Cer certainly not many. When I ask this question in California, the answer is typically none the, these days. But it's still the case that 14, 15% of the US adult population smoke, kind of remarkable understanding the health implications of it. Same thing with, with obesity. I don't see a lot of incredibly overweight people in this room. There are places in the United States where that's very much not the case. And we have a type two pandemic in the United States. It is a huge problem related to a whole series of things, social determinants of health, nutrition, et, et cetera, something that we have to address if we're gonna uh, increase not just, not just lifespan, but more, more important health span. Uh, this is, in a sense, the public health flavor of the month and of the year. It's an incredibly important one, social isolation and loneliness. We can see these, these points, and I hope you're going through them with me. A third of community dwelling, that is people who live in their homes and communities, not in, not in retirement homes, report feeling lonely. I suspect, and I'm not going to do this to you, but I have done it in, in some conferences. I did it recently in a public health conference. So I said to the, to the group, so how many people, it was an older group, how many, people, uh, how many people here have one chronic disease? And about 50% of the people raised, raised their hand, osteoarthritis, type two diabetes, something. How many of you have two, I, I then said, how many of you have two, multiple, multiple, multiple morbidities? Two, two chronic diseases. About half the hands went down, maybe 20% of the audience. My third question was, how many of you are lonely? Do you wanna guess how many people raised their hand? Zero, none. And, and what they did is, not surprisingly, they looked down. So when, after the question, they looked down. They were kind of looking at their, their neighbors. This is something, by the way, that older adults and younger adults share. Uh, one of the really, really interest, interesting things that we all think about, we all confront in a, in a world of social media, is that uh, there's some evidence that people who spend more than two hours a day on social media actually report lonelier. So these devices intended to bring us together to create connection, to create new relationship, are really not doing, not doing their, their, their job. And you can see the relationship between isolation, an objective factor, loneliness, subjective. You can feel lonely in a crowded room and you can not feel lonely on your own, but the impacts uh, on health are significant. If this doesn't scare us, uh, nothing else in my, in my presentation should. About half of, of U.S. adults, uh, pre-retirees in, in effect, have about 100,000 bucks or less 
in investable, in investable assets. This is a, lim a Limran num number. So what's, what's the significance of, of this? By the way, about half of that group have nothing. They have nothing. Entirely, entirely dependent on Social Security. So look at, this, look at this data point. This is from Fidelity. It, sa it says that the, that the average 65-year-old couple in America will spend $280,000 out of pocket on health alone. $280,000 out of pocket. So half of our population, $100,000 or less. Half of them, nothing. $280,000 on, on health out, out of pocket. That's not, that's not housing, that's not leisure, that's not transpo transportation, uh, a significant ish issue. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide in, in detail because I want to be mindful of, of time, but this is focused on, on middle-income people and, again, kind of makes the point that net, net of, house, of housing wealth, and, again, questions about, about capturing that wealth, et cetera, is something that we could, we could all discuss. People have very little money in the United States. Now, this is, you know, and I know Catherine and others focus on this and, and, and really are leaders on, the, on this point, this notion of a desire to work longer. So this is, in a sense, a good thing. It, it's, it doesn't solve all of our problems. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't substitute for social safety nets and rational public health policies, but it does make the point that people understand that whether for challenge or for financial reasons they want and need to work to work longer. So this model of retirement, the gold, the gold watch, the slap on, on the back and the and the head to the to the, and I wish Governor Polis was still here. Yes, yes, they should stay in Colorado and not move to the coastal community in Florida where they play shuffleboard and kind of wait, wait to die. That's that's yesterday's model, um, is is where we're headed. And it's good. Because work's not only good for your wealth, work is good for your health. And I want to make this point to, to employers. This is not just something you're doing to staff your businesses. This is not just something you're doing to ensure connection, intergenerational connection with younger employees. This is something you're, you're doing to improve the, the lives of those older workers. And again, you can see, uh, and there, there are plenty, there's plenty more, by the way, where this comes from. Again, point is, not just good for wealth, Good, good for health. Now, I don't know, Ramsey, whether you're going to uh, be talking about ageism during your, your presentation, but, but uh, what you can see is what is the impediment to that desire? Sure, structural unemployment is a risk. Long-term automation is, is a risk. How do we deal with the advent of robotics and all, and all the rest? But the reality is today, a significant number of older, of older workers <clears throat> believe that ageism is impeding their ability to progress. They are not being trained in the same way as younger workers. And it's really a basis of, of kind of crazy assumptions that have, have absolutely no evidence to support them. Things like, and again, you can kind of, kind of understand the bias, I should invest in a younger worker because that younger worker will stay with me forever. Just not, tr not true. Actually, the data says exactly the opposite. Older workers, probably a, a product of generational conventions are actually more loyal and more likely to stay employed in, in, in a place, therefore justifying uh, ongoing, ongoing um, education and, and, and investment. So you can see these are really significant numbers. And I know uh, one, of, one of Pat Milligan's colleagues is going to be talking later, but let's just read it. The last frontier of diversity and inclusion is aging. At the most respected multinational companies, the single class not represented from a diversity and inclusion perspective is older workers, LGBT, racial and ethnic diversity, women, people with physical disabilities, veterans. You can find an affinity group in a corporation for everything except an older worker. Joanne Jenkins, my pal, Ramsey's boss at uh, AARP says today, it is socially unacceptable to ignore, ridicule, or, stereo or stereotype someone based on their gender, race, or orientation, sexual orientation, so why is it still acceptable to do this to people based on their age? Living, condi living conditions. So, so if, if any of you know what this is, this is the original Sun City developed by the brilliant uh, Del Webb, who of course had two potential opportunities. One is he could have bought uh, land in the, in the urban core, very difficult to develop, had to deal with entitlement challenges and all the rest, created intergenerational, transit-friendly, 
uh, lifelong learning op opportunities, health proximate, uh, health proximate housing, or what he could do is buy worthless land in the middle of the desert and invest money in marketing, which is exactly what he did brilliantly. And he created a new, a new norm, a new ethic, a new, a new culture. And, and by the way, when Sun City opened, uh, just about just about 1960, if I re if I recall it, I think there were 100,000 cars lined up waiting to get in to get in, into this place. So, brilliant guy. But guess what? In my generation, boomers. I'm by the way just about to turn 68. In my in my generation, less and less interest in this model, less and less interest in in Xers, less and less interest in, in millennials, and we don't know what the Gen Z data is yet, but we will, and I suspect they'll have absolutely no interest at all. So, so we will see. So, <clears throat> so, so good or bad, this, this is, by the way, uh, for anybody who's a real estate entrepreneur in the audience, this is the slide you should pay attention to. Of, of, I'm just, I'm alerting you ahead of time. This is the slide you should pay attention to. Good or bad, 76% of US adults, according to polling data, say that they want to age in their homes. Now, by the way, that is not necessarily a good solution for them, but it's what they say they want. Look at, look at point two. Just look at, read it. I'm not even gonna read it to you. Just read it to yourself and tell me if that's not a problem and a massive business opportunity. 1% of US homes in the US offer the five basic universal design features. 1%, 76% wanna remain in their homes. 1% of those homes are, are even marginally ready for that, for that reality. And by the way, the five basic design elements are kind of the baseline characteristics to do things like avoid the simplest falls and, and all the rest. And you can see the disability number as well. Now I wanna, I, I, I said to you, I'm gonna talk about both, both good and bad, and I'm getting to good, don't worry, but uh, I think it's just irresponsible for somebody in my, in my position not to talk about what I'm about to talk about, and that is longevity and inequality. I think we talk a lot about income inequality in our, in our society. I think the ultimate tragedy is a disparity in time. What is the single most valuable thing we have? And I tell you, as anybody in my age group in this audience knows, the older you get, the more you recognize that the only thing more important than, than money is time. And what we know is that there, are, there is time inequity, and that time inequity is a product of a lot of complex factors. Again, some describe the social, social determinants of health, economic, uh, environmental determinants of health, ed, et cetera, education, income, access to healthcare, food choices, smoking rates, exercise, housing, safety, and pollution, et cetera. And just to make the point, in Chicago's Hyde Park, where 70% of the residents have a bachelor's degree or higher, life expectancy is 13 years longer than in Washington Park to the west. In my town, a resident of Malibu, lives 15 years, 11.5 years longer than his or her counterpart in Compton. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, 77, 10 years longer in the Manhattan Financial District. In Houston, a pretty extreme example, Clear Lake, 23 years longer than somebody in Trinity Gardens. And I will tell you, as much as I do love Colorado, even in Denver County, you suffer the same challenge. So if there is a social call to action that I have in, in, in this conversation. It's about the responsibility we all have to deal with this. Now, we have some, we have some good examples uh, from other parts of the world. Some of you know about Blue, Blue Zones. This was uh, you know, created and promoted by my friend Dan Butner, who writes for National Geographic. He's got a book out, Where Longevity Thrives. These are places around the world which tend to have relatively long lives, relatively long health spans, and there are a series of characteristics that, uh, that I want to talk about. There, by the way, is one blue zone in the United States, just one, that's Loma Linda, California. Uh, how, many people have you, how many people have even heard of Loma Linda, California? Oh, okay, well, good. That's because you're an educated group. Uh, Loma Linda, California is a little dinky community east of Los Angeles, kind of between Los Angeles and Palm Springs. Uh, it's, it's a Seventh-day Adventist community. So, so what makes Loma Linda interesting? And by the way, not a place where I want to live. I'm not Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist and, and, um, and there are a series of things that I wouldn't find particularly attractive, but it's informative. It tells, it tells us the kinds of, the kinds of characteristics that, that matter. Uh, plant-based plant -based diet, 
high engagement in faith community, incredibly low divorce rates, families living near each other, walkable, walkable community and community loyalty, community connection, a very, very good health system in a, in a, small, in a small community and access for, for all of its residents. So even if places like Loma Linda, California, or by the way, another one to think about would, would be Provo and Orem, Utah, another place that probably wouldn't be the right place for me to live, but very similar characteristics. So, so we don't have to live in places that, are, that aren't heterogeneous. We don't have to live in places that, that may not have other attributes that we, that we seek, but we can learn from those, those places, and Loma Linda is an example of that. Now, by the way, we have a little bit of good news on the, on the uh, longevity front. You probably know that for three years running, the US went the wrong way, unlike virtually any of our other peer countries. A Little bit of a problem in the UK. Any of our other peer countries on, on average long, longevity. Uh, we had a little bit of a reversal this year, just a little, a little bit of a reversal. Why? You know the reasons. Opioid abuse, gun violence, suicide, alcoholism, uh, and, and a terrible diet. And again, think about disparity and, and, and equity. Now, I said uh, bad news and good news. And here's the good, here's the good news, which is incredibly exciting, and I was thrilled to hear the governor's comments earlier. Read this from Standard & Poor's. No other force is likely to shape the future of national economic health, public finances, and policymaking as the irreversible rate at which the world's population is, is aging. So longevity, longevity economy. It's not just about older workers. It's about intergenerational workforces, the power of connection, and the complementary skills the young and old workers share. The, the ingenuity, creativity, risk-taking characteristics of the young, the balance, multi-sectoral problem solving and opportunity creating characteristics of the old. Put an older worker together and a younger worker, worker together and the evidence suggests increasingly that mixed age teams outperform same age teams of, of any age. So this is a powerful opportunity for employers. I know that Ramsey is gonna talk about this later. This is, this is AARP data and, and, uh, and it's an exciting number. US longevity economy, 8.3 trillion in, in the latest, in the latest Numbers, Ramsey, and, and um, uh, again, uh, if this was a country, it'd be the third largest, uh, largest uh, economy in the world. This is product services, innovations, related economic activity for people 50 plus. Uh, it, the remarkable thing about this is it's an underserved community. It's an underserved population. It's an underserved con consumer group. We still lack products, services, and, and ideas that are developed for older, for older consumers. So what would, what would the potential be, for example, if Colorado not only embraced the notion of the importance of older workers, but Colorado announced that it was gonna become the, the global center of the longevity economy to spur businesses, technologies, innovation, products, services. Sometimes, you know, my wife who's the same, the same age, she's sitting in the audience and sometimes I, I say, you know, you see that woman over there? When I met her, she liked, she liked beautiful bags and really good shoes. She still likes beautiful bags and really good shoes. The only, the only thing is she likes more expensive ones th these days, except when it comes to the shoes, now she wants flats. Uh, you know, uh, why, why is it that when we walk by a, a young couple, an attractive young couple with a beautiful baby carriage that looks like a Ferrari, Right, it's 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 platinum or or it, it's it's gorgeous. It has sweeping lines, and then all of us. How many people have a mom or dad with an old bent aluminum walker? Right. So uh, how come I'm looking at the camera right now, Ralph Lauren? When are you going to make a branded walker for for old, for older people? So there's there's the potential. So here are just some a uh, few examples. Don't laugh at the one on the bottom right. Products and services. Let's let's now talk about about, about change. So so uh, this is just a group of organizations, and we have several sitting in this room. AARP, our friends at Mercer, and a number of others, who are focused on kind of promoting, advancing, and elevating uh, information about the potential for longer work, for older workers, intergenerational, multi generational workforces. I'm excited about that. Education. Uh, I think I think this is this is the next exciting opportunity for uh, communities, for states, 
uh, public and public and, and and private. And I'll simply make this this comment. Look, there are a lot of great programs. Uh, we were I was having a side uh, side discussion earlier with Catherine's dad about OSHA. It's a wonderful uh, program that exists in in many uh, universities around the country. But most programs focused on older adults are age segregated. Right there. Continuing education programs sitting on the on the side of the university. There are OSHA programs in the evening for, for older adults. The, the power, again, of intergenerational student bodies is something that is just beginning to be realized. And why is this important? It's important for young people. It's important for old people. They benefit from each other. But it's also important for the institutions. Below Harvard, Yale, Stanford, University of Chicago, et cetera, Princeton, below that, in the United States, I can tell you, and frankly, in many places in, in the world, colleges and universities are struggling. Why? Because young people aren't having children at replacement rate. If you look, if you look at enrollments in small liberal arts colleges, in second and third year, second and third tier public universities, in second and third tier private private universities, what you see is a struggle to identify prospective students. So why are those universities understanding the changing demography still only focused on 18 to 25 year olds? Why not see the entire spectrum of the population as a potential, I'll use the word, customer for your, for your services? So we have this potential, potentially beautiful solution for young people, men mentoring, cross-generational benefit, for older people, lifelong learning, uh, stimulation, et cetera, and for the institutions them, themselves. The fact that they're not, not acting on it is simply a reflection of lack, of lack of creativity and lack of advanced thinking and planning. Something needs, needs to change. We need to change habits. So I talked a little bit earlier about health. Ob obviously, we everybody in this room understands this and knows this, and frankly, Colorado is a uh, is, a, is a relatively healthy state compared to many of its peers around the United States. If I was in many states in the South, some states in the, in the Midwest, it would be a much more difficult uh, com conversation. But exercise, nutrition, we know, we know the right thing to do. And by the way, uh, do you know what percentage of the US, U.S. health economy is spent on prevention and wellness? Anybody know in the room? Percentage, so it's, it's about maybe a, a smidge less than 5%, about 90% on treatment and care, about 5% on research and cure, around 5%, maybe a little bit less, on something we know that works, right? In my lifetime, by the way, I would say for the younger people in your lifetime, there's one thing that has changed, uh, changed health more than anything else. In my lifetime, probably two things. My lifetime, probably uh, the polio vaccine and smoking cessation and tobacco control. So for, the young, for anybody who's not my age, younger people in, in the room, it's, it's smoking cessation. It's dramatic drop in smoking rates. Massive, massive, massive health, health effect. What if we just invested more time, energy, money, resources, attention to the things that we know that work? Changing perception. So this is my, my pal, Linda Freed, who runs the Mailman School of Public Health at, at, at um, at Columbia, older people in an aging society are a dividend. It will require great imagination to envision roles and responsibilities that capitalize on the capabilities of mature minds and match their aspirations to give back and leave the future better than the, pre than the present. So changing perception, this is something that I, that I work on. Yes, I do live in LA. Yes, I do run into, into folks in, in Hollywood. You know, we all understand that this is kind of the, these are a couple examples, you know, Matthau and, and Lemon and grouchy old men and grandma in the, in the Beverly Hillbillies, et, et, et cetera. That's kind of the old view. And the good news is it's beginning to change. It's really early days, but it's beginning to change. The intern, not a great picture, but De Niro as the, as the uh, both me mentee and mentor. Obviously, Helen Mirren uh, looking beautiful on the cover of AARP uh, magazine. And, and by the way, uh, Lauren Hutton still modeling now in her late 70s, I, I, I think, kind of amazing. Kaminsky, Method, Grace, and Frankie, et, et cetera. Something all of us certainly who interact with entertainment, media, journalism, et cetera. Rich, you know this. You're you're a journalist. Um, need to focus on more. How do we how do we change public narrative? How do we tell a new a new story? And of course, Mick, who did say, uh, "I'd rather be dead than singing Satisfaction" when he's 45. Here's Mick, 76. He had. 
he had he had a, he had a couple heart problems, but but he's but he's back and, and do, doing well now. Beyond just work, I think the opportunity for all of us at a, at a certain age is to capitalize on our generativity. This is the uh, the the psychological characteristic identified by Eric Erickson, the famous psychologist, many years ago, and it's been worked on since. This notion that we have a reflex, an instinct to pass down, pay forward, not just with our kids and grandkids, but beyond that, through mentorship and other things that, that we find value for. And now, again, I want to make, make the, the case. This is, you know, Rich, something you and I talked about la last night. The, the, obviously, when we contribute through volunteer sh volunteering and community activity, we know we're doing good for beneficiaries of our, of our work. But as, as I often say, every single, every single geriatrician, every single uh, internist, primary care doctor, in addition to making you, uh, making you give some blood and pee in a cup and asking you what, you what you're eating and asking you how much you're sleeping, should also say, so tell me about your volunteering because it's unbelievably good for your, for your health. Um, so I'm not going to go through, through each one of these data points. You can read them your, yourself. I will, I will make the point about the first one here. That's research done by Becca Levy at Yale, who, who does kind of amazing research. And by the way, brand new WHO report that she was the PI on, uh, so that I, that I absolutely commend, commend reading. So what Becca found is that people who have a positive, a positive self-image about aging, by the way, very much derived from this notion of purpose of, of, of what really matters, uh, live on average 7.5 years longer. You can look at her study to understand how she controlled. But by the way, uh, her conclusion was more significant variable than body mass index, smoking, or, or exercise. So, so again, what we know, it's intuitive, is that what happens above our neck is just as important as what happens below our neck. And what happens above our neck, again, very much related to, to this question of pur purpose, meaning of life, cont contribution, obviously work an important, an important part of that. Uh, and again, the, the implications are really significant. Go back to my bullet point on, on AD and dementia. Look at, bullet, look at bullet point two here. This is from uh, Patricia Boyle at Rush Medical Center in Chicago. And what, and what she says, what her research has found, is not that she has a cure for Alzheimer's. There is no cure for Alzheimer's, let's be clear but that the potential to defer, to impede the disease and defer onset is powerful and is real and is connected to this, this kind, of, kind of activity. So again, go back to my numbers. Remember, I don't know if you remember my numbers, 270, 280, 290 billion, and I said potentially close to a trillion, fully, fully loaded, right? Imagine if we could simply defer onset for just a couple of years. I mean, people are, by the way, death rates remain consistent at 100%. People are going to die of, of something. But if we could simply slow down the disease because we were all volunteering and engaged in, meaning, in meaningful work, understand not just the potential for each one of us, for our families, for the, for the beneficiaries of our work, but for the broader society. So again, this is just more, by the way, uh, research. Again, I commend to all of you. If, you, if for any of you in the field who aren't reading this stuff and and using it in your advocacy and in your work, I would really commend you do. There's there's great there's great stuff on the on the uh, Corporation for National and Community Service website about research on the impacts of senior core. There is the Johns Hopkins research on on Experience Core. Again, powerful. By the way. Uh, so I, I, I promised, I think, Catherine, that I wouldn't get political, but I will say that uh, somebody in leadership in the United States has proposed to uh, pro proposed eliminating the Corporation of National and Community Service, and thank God, a bipartisan uh, a group of uh, people, both in the Senate and the House, have have uh, stopped that that effort. So, so senior corps, foster grandparents, and AmeriCorps at least appear to be safe for the near term. By the way, they're, round, they're rounding errors in terms of the, the size of the national budget. So again, you can, you can see this. I'd be happy to talk to any of you about it before. Uh, Catherine mentioned that I, I, I chair the board of Encore very proudly. And this is just, again, a handful of organizations that you can look at, go to, think about. Uh, I suspect many of you, many of you know them. Uh, and, and we could talk about more. Now, I, I did say I was, an, I was a, an Angelino. I'm a Californian. So I have to talk about this just for a second. I'm getting to Colorado. Don't worry. Um, 
just a very interesting thing that I've been involved in in Los Angeles, LA City, and LA County, the largest and most diverse population of older adults in the United States. And one of the things that we pushed uh, in conjunction with uh, was University of Southern California, UCLA, and, and by the way, AARP, was an initiative in the, in the city and the county to ensure that, that because a, a number of you were subject matter experts, to ensure that the expertise of very small agencies, city and county that deal, deal with older adults, are spread to other, other agencies throughout the city and the county. What that means is that in recreation and parks, building and safety, uh, economic development, there is, a, there is an expert like that woman sitting right there who is, go, who is going to, to all of these meetings and, and is, uh, is involved in their, in their agenda setting. Uh, and of course, we have now our, our own master plan and aging in California, and so, and so do you. And, and we're, very, we're proud of Colorado for its, its progress on, on that front. And here's a nice, a nice quote from, from uh, Mayor Hancock of, of Denver. Denver's active lifestyle knows no age, li age limit. Uh, we, we're thrilled that Colorado wants to be a leader on this front. This is, by the way, a report that we did on what we called age forward communities that you might be interested in. It's on our website if anybody wants to take a look at it. We talk about how we grow, how we build, how we, how we care. These are the kind of key characteristics that we think that city leaders uh, and community leaders need, need to focus on. And, um, and I didn't have as pithy a quote from Governor Polis as I, as I could wanted to. So I've got one from Hickenlooper. But I'm going to get one from, Pol from Polis, and that is, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty great quote. Every Coloradan should know that they have a forever place to call, to call home as, as they age. Now, just to, just to finish, if I can finish, there we go. So Jack Kennedy, kind of remarkably, just to show that uh, we have lived through periods of presidential leadership, Jack Kennedy, at a time when the U.S. population was still very much younger, recognized the realities of demographic change. So very much like the realities of, clim of climate change, we have to project out a bit and see, and see what's coming. And Kennedy, in 1963, before his tragic death, said, it is not enough for a great nation merely to have add added new years to life. Our objective must be to add new life to those years. That, that call to action remains as true today as it was in 1963 and frankly much more, much more urgent. So, uh, so what I would commend to all of you is you think about both the challenges, reality of the challenges, the great potential of the opportunities, work, workforce, longevity economy, products and, products and, ser and services, and my, my call to you is, is how do you elevate the level of urgency, of immediacy, uh, for, for something that we know is going to change lives for all of us forever? And thank you very much.